Welcome to this presentation on deeper learning with text-dependent analysis in the classroom. Uh, this webinar is going to focus specifically on multiple choice questioning using a, a passage which is uh, assigned to the student to read and um, perform the, the analysis. This particular uh, presentation or webinar is focusing on the AQUEST tenets of assessment and educator effectiveness. And we have the learning goals today of reviewing what constitute text dependent and learning some strategies to uh, strengthen student skills in te text dependent activities. Plus, we want to make sure that we understand the basic principles of te text dependent uh, analysis and consideration with multiple choice, short answer, and full length writings or essays. So the first question we're going to explore uh, in this webinar is why text-dependent questions? Well, text-dependent questions make the visible uh, learning more more in front of us. That's because we have to have the readers go into the text, not out of the text, uh, which causes them to increase their concentration on what they're reading, uh, deepen their comprehension, and ultimately uh, stimulate the cog cognitive functions of their brain in consideration of the passage or passages which they're reading. We always want to promote deeper thinking and critical examination anytime we're reading, listening, or discussing. So working uh, and developing these skills through text-dependent questioning is, uh, is very important. So as a teacher, I suppose you're asking yourself, why does this matter to me? Well, we have these specific goals for text dependency and close reading and text dependent analysis. Um, in the moment right now, right at this very moment, we want to get a deeper comprehension of the passage. We want to have an understanding of the structure of the modes of the types of passages that the students are reading. And we want deeper writing in response to that passage. We want more than just surface answers. We actually want the students to go back into the writing rather than uh, call upon anything uh, out of the writing, which may be from their prior knowledge or their prior experiences. Um, we want them to learn the skills on how to approach text. Plus, the 2014 Nebraska English Language Arts College and Career Ready Standards call for us to be able to have our students respond to text dependent items, be uh, considerate and employ uh, close reading techniques, and to also be able to respond in various text dependent analysis formats. So what does this mean for us in the future? Well, it means that uh, then the students will be interacting with the text to create that deeper understanding. And also, um, our students will be able to respond with confidence to the comprehension items on the Nebraska State Assessment or any assessment that they take, which requires them to be able to uh, perform any kind of a text-dependent analysis activity. So let's first look at some examples and some non-examples of text-dependent items. Now, on the left side of the screen, you're going to see two items which are not text-dependent items. And on the right side of the screen, you do uh, there are text-dependent analysis items. Let me talk to you about the difference of them. So when we look at the first item, it asks the student to give three examples of how animals sleep in different ways. It's very uh, much on the surface, and it might be something that students either learned in the instruction, or it might be something that they have learned from their prior knowledge, such as reading it, experiencing it, or uh, observing it. Um, but when you look at the text-dependent uh, item on the right side of the screen, let me read that to you. 
Both passages tell about ways that different animals sleep in the wild. Explain why animals sleep in different ways. Write a well-organized response using specific evidence from both passages to support your answer. Now, when we look at this, we already know that the students are going to read two passages. And that in these two passages, they tell them about different ways that animals sleep in the wild. The key note here is in the second sentence as to what the task of the student actually is. It asks them to explain why animals sleep in different ways. Explain is the key word here. So we'll talk more about explain a little bit later, but explain means that they have to talk about the commonalities, they have to talk about the differences, they have to talk about um, all different types of it. They have to explain. They have to talk about the parts and how it works together. And then it asks them to write a well-organized response, whereas the example on the left just says give three examples, and those may be three words or three simple phrases. But this asks them to formally put it into a format. Uh, which uh, explains evidence from both passages, which supports their answers. So they have to go back into the text in order to be able to uh, withdraw the, the answers that support their response. So let's look at the second example. Identify the literary devices the author uses in this story. Provide evidence from the story in your response. And then let's read the text-dependent analysis example. Mood is the feeling or emotion that a reader experiences from a poem or story. Explain how the poet's word choice helps create mood throughout the poem. Write a well-organized response using specific evidence from the poem to support your answer. Now, the example on the left, it's not TDA, really, again, here, it just says identify the literary devices. So that calls for a listing or a uh, one, two, or three word answer and provide evidence from the story in your response would, again, just says that it's a listing because the example on the right side says explain how the poet's word choice helps create mood throughout the poem. There's that word explain again. So they're going to have to talk about the various parts and pull those parts uh, apart in order to best uh, identify or demonstrate how the poet's word choice helps create the, the mode throughout the poem. And um, also, they have to provide that evidence because it asks them to write a well-organized response using specific evidence from the poem to support your answer. So you see that on the right, the answer to either one of these text-dependent anal analysis items requires the student to dig deeper and to be more uh, conscious, uh, more forthgiving, more um, uh, extended answer, or even a short answer or an extended answer to, to uh, answer the, uh, the, uh, the task that the text-dependent analysis item asks. Whereas on the left, it merely asks for a listing or a uh, one or two or three word answer, perhaps a phrase. So the right is formal, more formal. The left is very, very independent. The right forces you to have to go back into the text, and the left says, uh, presents you with the idea that it can be from either your learning in the class or it can be from your prior knowledge or your experiences. Let's move on. Here, I have uh, some examples again. Uh, the three examples that you see circled are text-dependent items. Uh, let's look at the first one, and it says, In the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln says the nation is dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Why is equality an important value to promote? Now, what type of a response does this particular item solicit. If you look at the question or the item, the last sentence starts with the word why. Why always starts an opinion or, uh, or, or other um, 
defense type of why is equality response. Um, when we look over here at the uh, uh, text dependent item on the right, it says the Gettysburg address mentions the year 1776. According to Lincoln's speech, why is this year significant to the events described in the speech? Now there's a difference here. This does ask why also. But when we look at this why, it causes that they have to go into the significant events described in the speech. Whereas, so that takes them back into the passage, back into the Gettysburg Address, rather than on the left, it asks them only uh, why is equality an important value to promote. It it gives more of an opinion type of thing, whereas when we're looking here, it asks you to go in and support, uh, identify and support those significant events. It's, let's look at the center ones. It said, what were the major goals of the United Nations as outlined in the UN preamble? Here, again, this is not text dependent. Um, the goals could be something that you've either learned or something that you can go back and you can just list them and uh, you don't have to have any kind of uh, specific support for those. But if you look at the circled one on the right side, if you'd been on the UN committee with Eleanor Roosevelt, what goals would you have included in the UN preamble? In other words, that costs you to go back into... Uh, the preamble of the UN and actually look at what is there already and what would you have added. So it's asking you to look at look at the uh, the present document and then what would you add to uh, to that document. So you have to have that back into the text. You have to go into the text, not out of the text. And the last one here is a letter from. Uh, Birmingham Jail, Dr. King discusses nonviolent protests. Discuss in writing a time when you wanted to fight against something that you felt was unfair. Now, this is text dependent because you have to have read Letter from a Birmingham Jail in order to know what he discussed. And in other words, what ideas did he put forward? Because once you know what his ideas are, and you know what your ideas are, you can either support or deny what he has. When you get to the non-example on the right side of the pages, what can you infer from King's letter about the letter that he received? You know, when you do an inference, an inference is your best guess. It's, um, and when you have just your best guess, you don't always ha uh, have uh, the documentation or the direct, uh, the direct analysis of what happened in uh, what, what Dr. King's letter actually said. So this, again, on the right side, only asks for your opinion. So we've talked just a little bit about what a text-dependent item is or is not, and um, I think we're going to move on here and see where we're going into text-dependent analysis because we're going to dig a little bit deeper right now. We're going to look specifically at multiple choice items. Uh, multiple choice items um, can be generated from any kind of informational or other genre of passage or passages. There are some tips that uh, you need to share with your students, uh, especially when you're doing uh, guided practice or practice which actually helps them to have better success at answering text-dependent multiple-choice items. Tip number one is read the questions before reading the passage or infographic. Read the questions before reading the passage or infographic. Then number two is read the passage or examine the infographic carefully, underline key words, and sometimes here I like to add ideas. Then number three, try to answer questions before reading the options. In other words, you've read the questions, but don't read the options. So read the questions, read the passage, try to answer the questions before reading the options, and then read the answer options. 
you need to know that it's important here that you immediately eliminate answers you know are incorrect. And then the number five would be to choose the best remaining answer. Now, this success model works very well when the student has access to go back and look at the passage again when uh, answering the, the items uh, that are written for them in multiple choice. Sometimes in a testing situation it doesn't allow you to go back into the passage. So that's why it's very important that you use these tips for success anytime you are doing either guided practice with your students or they're doing personal practice. The more they practice this, the deeper readers they are, the more close reading they actually do in order to be able to answer items in which uh, a multiple choice or other another genre type of question they can go they can better recall the information that they need in order to choose the best answer or compose the best answer. Today we're going to use a passage called Adventurous Storyteller and you can see here on uh, the page that I have a link here to the actual uh, to the actual document. I'm going to take you out here to this just to show you what this document looks like. Okay, this particular passage starts off with a uh, with a, a narrative or with just a regular informational passage. And then it progresses on through to where we actually see an infographic uh, of the events of Jack London's life. So then here we have another format. And then finally, we actually have an excerpt from The Call of the Wild. So that's very important uh, there. And it goes on to the next page. So we want to make sure and we want to teach our students that when they are uh, reading the passage, that they read the complete passage. They read, if, it tell, if there's one passage that goes with it, with the uh, item, why well, they read just the one passage. But make sure that if there are multiple pages or multiple formats, such as informational and an infographic or a narrative or anything, make sure they, that your students read all of that. Let's go back to our PowerPoint here, and uh, we notice that um, uh, we have our passage. And now, uh, remember that in our Tips for Success, the first thing it told us to do in the model was to read all of the multiple choice items. So item number one is which evidence from Adventurous Storyteller best supports the idea that London was a very determined to be a writer. And number, the second multiple choice item is which idea from Adventurous Storyteller is supported by the timeline? And then the third multiple choice item is this question has two parts. Answer part A and then answer part B. Part A read the sentence from Adventurous Storyteller. He once said, I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent planet. What does this sentence mean? Part B, select two details from the passage that support the, I, the answer in part A. Select two. So those are the three items with uh, item three having two parts that the students will have to answer. So let's, we've done step one, we've read the questions. Now remember, step two would be for us to go back and read the text that what we just read, the, uh, the passages, which I just shared with you earlier. Then we come back and we look at the question and the multiple choice um, items. Now, the question, again, or the item, was which evidence from Adventure Storyteller best supports the idea that London was very determined to be a writer? Answer A is London wrote stories about working people and the hard times they had making a living. 
B. His goal was to write at least 1,000 words every day. He refused to stop even when he was sick. C. He was a, the best-selling and highest-paid author of his day. Many people also consider him to be the best writer. D. Readers can enjoy Jack London's energy and his talent for telling wonderful stories each time they open up one of his novels. So the next step on determining the best possible text-dependent uh, answer for this multiple choice item is to eliminate those which can't possibly be a part of it. Um, item D is one that cannot be a part of it. Um, see which evidence supports the idea he was very determined to become a writer. Uh, if D isn't one, uh, I wouldn't think C would be one. So A and B, I have to choose from them. Best supports the idea that London was very determined to be a writer. I'm going to select item B because his goal was to write at least 1,000 words every day and he refused to stop even when he was sick. Well, if I go back into the reading and I find in paragraphs 5 and 6, I actually find... Uh, this highlighted sentence. His goal was to write at least 1,000 words every day. He refused to stop even when he was sick. Oh, that kind of supports my, my, my thinking. So when I look at this, and there are my four items, yes, B is the correct answer. His goal was to write at least 1,000 words every day. He refused to stop even when he was sick. So now I have gone back into my reading and actually found the uh, support for the item that I chose, which was item B, which is the correct answer. Okay, now let's look at item two. Now, <clears throat> let's reread the item which says, which idea from Adventurous Storyteller is supported by the timeline? Now, remember that the timeline was the infographic in our uh, passages. So, let's read our three, or four options, rather. London educated himself before becoming a writer. London's writing career developed after his gold rush experience. London was an American writer of adventure tales throughout his entire life. London's famous stories were written about his time in Alaska. Now, the item again is which idea from Adventurous Storyteller is supported by the timeline? Now, supported by the timeline. So let's look at the timeline. That's when he was born, when he bought a boat and learned to sail, when he takes part in the Klondike gold rush, when he gets magazines assignments, he publishes, he publishes, and then he purchases a ranch. Hmm. Which idea from Adventurous Storyteller is supported by the timeline? Well, let's see. This one. He gets magazine assignments from Overland Monthly and uh, Atlantic Monthly. Because if we go back to the questions, London's writing de career developed after his gold rush experience. It can't possibly be that London was an American writer. Uh, it, it's true, but it's not supported by the timeline. And... D is not supported by the timeline, and A is not supported by the timeline. So it has to be the answer B. Okay. Yes, yes, that's correct. His writing career developed after his Gold Rush experience. Very good, very good. All right, let's go on. All right. This is that two-part question, and it's a little bit different for us to approach this question. So let's read. It says to answer part A and then part B. 
Part A, let's remind ourselves about the question. It says, read the sentence from Adventurous uh, Storyteller. He once said, I would rather be a superb, me superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent planet. What does that sentence mean? So, okay, so we've read that, and we go back, and we think about, or go back into the text, and we find that quote again, and then let's look at our possible answers. A, London preferred to live a life of excitement instead of a plain, safe one. B, London preferred to write fantasy stories instead of realistic and believable ones. C, London preferred to have life of fame instead of a simple, normal one. Or D, London preferred to think about far away place, places instead of nearby familiar ones. Hmm. Well, I don't think it's item B because uh, he wrote other things. Because remember, he wrote those uh, magazine articles uh, for those two publications. And uh, London lived a very um, an obscure life. He really didn't. He he didn't mind that he was famous, but he didn't. It, I, you couldn't say that he preferred it. And. Um, it wasn't the fact that he preferred to think about faraway places. It's just that he wrote about the places that he went to and, and the experiences that he had. So uh, my answer, after eliminating the ones that are not possible, is answer A. Let's see how I did. Okay. Well, let's see. It wants me to actually go on to my answer B, because remember I said it was A. Select two details from the passage that supports the answer, my answer, in part A. London grew up near the waterfront. London spent many hours reading at the library in Oakland, California. London left Berkeley because he wanted a lively, livelier lifestyle. Um, London worked in a wide variety of jobs, from a sailor to a gold prospector. Well, let's go back into the reading and find those things. Here's where he said he spent many hours in the library at Oakland. Mm -hmm. And then it says he wrote stories about working people and hard times they had making a living. He knew those problems firsthand. And then he worked as a sailor, rancher, so on and so on and so forth. Just to name a few of his many jobs. So he had a lot of different kinds of jobs. So I said A. And in part A... Yep, he preferred a life of excitement except instead of a plain and safe one. That was my selection. Now I had to find those two things that supported it. Um, it doesn't tell me anything about the fact that he grew up near the, a waterfront. Um, and it doesn't really say that he left Berkeley because he wanted a livelier lifestyle. It does talk specifically about being in the library at Oakland, and it does uh, specifically talk about that he had a wide variety of jobs. So I'm going to select B and D after looking in the uh, back into the text as my answers for part B. Whoa, I was wrong. I was right about D, but he left Berkeley because he wanted a uh, livelier work style, lifestyle. Ra wow. Is that two tales that support my answer A? Huh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look. London preferred to life of excitement instead of a safe and plain one. All right, so th then these two answers do make sense to me, and I could correct my answers if I go back and they wanted a livelier. Ah, see, the classic case, going back and looking, and does my answer make sense? All right, so these were the tips for success that I used in answering multiple choice items, those three items using the passage uh, Adventure Storyteller. And uh, remember that you read the question before reading the passage or the infographic, and then you read the passage or the infographic carefully, underlining or highlighting any information you deem to be especially important or key. Uh, try to answer the questions before reading the options, and read the answer options and eliminate answers you know are incorrect. 
and then the last task you have is to choose the best remaining answer. I want to thank you for being a part of this webinar and I uh, especially am excited to have presented this to you. Uh, if you go back into the description of uh, this webinar, you will find a link to all the resources which accompany this, um, this webinar. Thank you for joining me and I look forward to talking with you again.